welcome you once again to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for day number three of time trials for the 71st running of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. It's another beautiful day in Indianapolis. The temperature up to 81 degrees. The humidity only 35%. Winds are from the southeast at 5 to 10 miles an hour. Bright, sunny skies. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bob Jenkins, and welcome once again to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Another interesting day of qualifying. 27 are now in the field. We have had 10 qualifiers so far today. Now, there has been some discussion about how complicated the qualifying procedure is here at Indianapolis, but really it's quite simple. You have to remember some basic things. There are four qualifying days. Each car is allowed three attempts. There are two warm-up laps, and the four-lap average is used. Now, they line up according to speed according to day, with the day three qualifiers lining up behind the first and second day qualifiers. And remember tomorrow when we get to bubble day, they bump the slowest car in the lineup regardless of what day he qualified on. Well, we welcome to our broadcast booth once again, Dick Simon, who was on the racetrack about 10 minutes ago and has just joined us in the booth. Dick, it's been an interesting day once again. There's a lot of emotion down on pit road, I was, would assume, because a lot of these drivers are very keyed up, hoping to make the field for this year's race. Yes, they are, Bob. Actually, of course, this is Kentucky Derby of all races, and uh, to make this race has to be one of the most enthusiastic things that can happen in your whole life. And I did jump out of the car. I wondered if I was going to get here in time. <laughs> <laughs> we're glad you did. What were you doing out there, working on race day setups? Well, we were in the, uh, the 22T car or 23T, either one. It's our spare car. And, you know, you don't plan on anything unfortunate to happen on carburation day. But if it did, we came here with a backup, and uh, we had not spent any time with it, Bob. So I was just more or less sorting the car. All right, as I said, we have had 10 qualifiers today here in the third day of qualifying so far. But one driver who is not in the field yet finished second in last year's 500. We go to the pit area, and this report from Larry Newber. Bob, absolutely right. A year ago, Kevin Cogan won the Indianapolis 495. He was passed by Bobby Rahal with less than 10 minutes to go in the race. But here in the afternoon of the third day of qualifying for the 1987 race, Kevin is not yet in the field. This morning, Kevin was the first car out to attempt qualification runs this morning. You were able to go 204, but it just didn't work out, Kevin. You're still not in the field. Your thoughts? Well, we had a little too much push in the car, and uh, we really want to get this Marlboro car in today, so we're going to go for it probably in about 10 minutes or so. Kevin, this is such an emotional moment in any race driver's life, qualifying for the Indianapolis 500. You seem pretty calm about this. What about inside? Well, I want to get the car in the, in the race so I can have something to eat. I haven't had a bite all day long. It's just one of those things you're not hungry. You just want to, you know, it's pretty uh, total mental game, really. Kevin, how long will you guys wait? Obviously, you want to qualify here in the third day. Will you wait till 5 o'clock? Are we going no. out shortly? No, we're going to go out pretty quick. Probably, I just wanted to get the shadows so I could see the line when I first enter down in uh, 1 down here. Uh, we're not going to wait too long just in case something happens and I can jump in Emerson's car and qualify if we have a problem. Thanks, Kevin. I know this is a very gut-wrenching moment for you. Matter of fact, Kevin kind of jokingly said to us that he was going to wait to qualify until we went on the air, and he kept his promise. Further on down pit road with our three-time winner of the Indianapolis 500, one of our three-time winners of the Indianapolis 500 is my colleague, Gary Lee. Well, thank you, Larry. Two words that we hear frequently this month here at the Speedway, compatibility and balance. Now, I do have a guy to talk to me about that. Three-time Indianapolis champion Johnny Rutherford the drivers of the 87 marchers are saying the car is not that compatible with the new radio. They're having trouble finding the balance, and once they do, it's very difficult to maintain that balance. Well, that's about it in a nutshell. The, uh, there's nothing wrong with the tire. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, like you say, the compatibility with the March chassis and the design of the thing. And so we're having to work diligently at trying to find the right setup to where the thing will react properly and repeat for you. And that's what's very hard is to find that balance you're speaking of in getting the car to be able to repeat the, uh, the setup over and over and over. And so it's been, a, it's been pretty dicey here this month. And once in the show, there is a concern as to what the traffic, the turbulence will do on race day. Yes, uh, that's the, the second part of this thing is to be able to get out and uh, run with somebody and find out what their turbulence will do to you. I've had occasion in practice to run with a couple of guys and uh, it's just like it was last year only maybe a little uh, a little tougher with this other problem we've got so it's it's one of those things where we just have to wait and see I guess. I know your goal is to tie one of the tough Texan in four wins here we wish you well thanks for stopping Thank by. Thank you. One of the real advantages to qualifying last weekend is having a chance to work on the race day setup this past week. 
And here with one of those drivers, another colleague, Alan Massengale. Okay, thanks. We're outside Michael Andretti's garage. A different atmosphere for his team today. They've got the trailer out here, Michael. What's going on? Well, we're getting ready to go up to Milwaukee. We're going to be running Monday and Tuesday, and, uh, you know, we, we have to get ready for that race, which is a week following uh, Indy. So, uh, you know, it, it keeps going. It's not only Indy. Uh, you know, we, we feel we had a really good week uh, this week. We ran all the way up till Thursday in the heat of the day every day, and uh, uh, we feel we, we've gotten the Craco car going real strong. Uh, we've been running well on full tanks, and... You know, we're really looking forward to the race. Your impression of the speeds today, they don't have that wind problem you had last weekend. Yeah, I'm quite surprised. I thought it'd be much quicker than they're running, actually, because conditions are fantastic, really. It was cool this morning. There was no wind. Uh, I was expecting to see some 213 laps, but, uh, you know, obviously they don't have their cars that well yet because uh, if we would have had these conditions last week, you would have seen the record fall for sure. Thank you, Michael Andretti. Look for him outside third row at the Indy 500. Let's go back to Bob now. All right, thank you. So there's a guy looking forward to the next race, Milwaukee. Here's a lineup as it stands right now. On the pole, Mario Andretti alongside Bobby Ray Hall and Rick Mears completes row number one. In the second row, A.J. Foyt, Roberto Guerrero, and our guest today, Dick Simon. In the third row, it's Ari Leyendijk, Johnny Weatherford, and Michael Andretti. Going to row number four, Jeff McPherson, Scott Brayton, and Jeff Rabham. In the fourth row, Fittipaldi, Heimrath, and Rich Vogler. Then going to row number six for the starting lineup, Gary Bentonhausen, Pancho Carter, and Danny Sullivan. In the seventh row, Fabrizio Barbaza, a rookie, veteran Gordon Johncock, and Derek Daly. In row number eight, it's Al Unser, then his son, Al Unser Jr., and Randy Lewis. In row number nine, Jose Le Garza, and Stan Fox and Sammy Swindell track is open for practice but qualifications anticipated at any moment from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. ESPN live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the third day of time trials for this year's 500 mile race and right now the track is quiet the yellow light is on you can see the uh, observers in the main straightaway checking over the track. Well, here is our time trial summary. The uh, 53 presentations at the line so far, 48 have made an attempt to qualify. 27 have made the field. There are five rookies in the field, and the field average at this moment is 207.549 miles an hour. Now, when we ran through the uh, starting lineup just a few minutes ago, you may have noticed a change in the position of Danny Sullivan. That is because Sullivan withdrew his Penske chassis earlier today. And Danny Sullivan went instead with the 1986 March, and he qualified at 210.271 miles an hour. It was really a good run for Danny Sullivan, and he moved, moved up his uh, time and speed considerably when he withdrew the Penske. He had qualified at 205.288, so he moved up just about five miles an hour here in his run, Dick. Fantastic. You notice he come right down just over the line a little bit. That's adjusting for a little bit of push, probably. Coming out very close to the wall, and as he comes down, he gets a little bit away from the wall to get uh, some of the clean air by both sides of the car. Andy Sullivan from Louisville, Kentucky, a former winner of this 500-mile uh, race. On his qualification attempt again, this was earlier today when they withdrew the Penske chassis. They've been having trouble with the Penske chassis all uh, month, in fact, all year. They didn't get that much time in the car here in Indianapolis or any place else for that matter. It was late arriving from England, so they have decided to withdraw that Penske and go instead with the 86 March. Danny Sullivan's uh, speeds were 209.707 on the first lap, 210.571 lap number two, then 210.438, and 210.369 was his final lap. There's the checkered flag, and Danny Sullivan qualified at an average of 210.271 miles an hour, and right now that puts him outside of row number six. Well, Larry Newber is down uh, in the pit area, and he's with a veteran who has come out of retirement to run this year's race. Larry? Bob, it's a homecoming. Some of the veterans are still struggling, but this one has a nice wide grin on his face, and I guess it probably started about... 11.30 this morning as you were streaming down the backstretch and what, lap one, lap two, lap three, or was it after the checker, Gordon Johncock? Well, it was really after the checkered because you never know, you know. We had three laps at 2.08, and uh, when I see that, I thought, I slowed down, I don't know what it was, 2.06 or 2.07 on the last lap just to make sure that uh, nothing went wrong. 
Gordy, there were some tough times just before you left the league, and even you on the inside of your heart must have had some thoughts about, was this really a good idea? But you must feel so much better right now. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, I think I kind of made a hasty decision in life, but I kind of regretted it afterwards, especially four or five months afterwards, sitting home watching it on TV, and I just knew in my own mind that uh, I needed to be back. Gordy, it's an unfortunate set of circumstances that gets you this ride. This is the car that Jimmy Crawford was supposed to qualify for this race. And matter of fact, last week it was a candidate for front row. What about the rest of the season now? Will you have a ride for the rest of the car in the car year? Well, I don't know. We really uh, we haven't talked anything about it, so I don't. I would hope so. I would like to. Definitely would like to, but uh, that I don't know because we haven't talked about it. The SDP has come on board uh, to be our sponsor, which uh, I'm very thankful to them. You know. I've, We've worked together for a lot of years, uh, 1973 and 82 when I won the race. Uh, STP was a sponsor and also helped from Valvoline. So, you know, with the two of them, I'm, I'm really thankful to them, and they've got enough confidence in me to come back and support us. Gordy, we're watching the run right now as you and I have this conversation. Was it an easy run for you, or was it a white knuckler for you too, like it has been for so many people this month? No, it wasn't a white knuckler. It was a fairly easily run. I told the guys, uh, some of the crew, uh, in the morning before we went out, that if we had to, that we could run 208 or 210. I'd left a little bit uh, in spare, you know. I don't always go out and run as hard as I can all the time, especially coming back after being off for two years, because if something had happened to me during the month, I'd have spun and hit the wall or something. I just know what everybody would have said. So I didn't give the chance to say that. So. I just kind of saved it uh, for qualifying, and now we're just trying to get set up for the race. Well, proof of the comfort level was how consistent the first three laps were. I'm curious about one thing. You spent most of your recent career behind the wheel of a Cosworth-powered car. What about the Buick? Does it feel different? Do you feel like this is a power plant for the future, which hopefully is now? Well, definitely the Buick is strong. And, you know, I'm glad to see the Uh, thanks to Jim Crawford, uh, he's done a, the majority of the testing on this, and they've done a great job because we had very few problems with the Buick uh, during the month of May here, and I'm very confident that the, the Buick's going to finish the race. Gordy, one final question. I know that the physical part of coming back here is something that you have to work to get back into sync, at least psychologically, but what about the social part? There's so much emphasis on concentration. There must be a hundred people coming up, pounding you on your shoulder, saying, welcome back, Gordy. But in point of fact, you need to concentrate. You're out here working here on the afternoon of Saturday. That must be a difficult assignment. Well, not really. Uh, when you get out here to get a run in your race car, you don't think about that. But uh, a lot of people have said that, which makes me feel very good, you know. Uh, it seems like I've had a lot of support in, in uh, coming back from the race fans, and, and that's what it takes. You know, it really gets your confidence up to, to go out and put on a show for the fans because uh, they're, they're the people that make it all. Gordy, thank you very much. Bob, we're going to go back to you. This is a man, remember, who has won the Indianapolis 500 twice. There were two other times he was leading when he dropped out late. And one time he competed, completed the 500 miles in less time than the winner. He still didn't win. But John Cock is a threat to win this year. You've got to believe that. He starts in 20th position. His four-lap average was 207.990. And three laps were above 208. He dropped off about two miles an hour on his fourth lap to 206 and a half. Well, we have some action in the qualifying line. Now, every car that's presented for a qualification attempt must go through a technical inspection to make sure the car is legal. And that's what's going on right now as Kevin Kogan stands at the front of his car. And we anticipate a qualifying run just uh, a few minutes from now. Another veteran who qualified for today's race was Al Unzer. He was pressed into service just earlier this week. Of course, uh, Danny and Gaius was supposed to be the third driver in the Penske stable, but Danny was not cleared medically to run in this race, and so that gave the ride to Al Unzer Sr. Here he is on lap number three of his run. His first two laps were 207.958, second lap 208.295, and he is just about to complete lap number three of the qualifying run, and it was 207.531 miles an hour. Dick, it looks like it could be the year of the veteran. Here you are, the oldest driver in the field, and you're starting in sixth position. We have seen Gordon Johncock come out of retirement. Here's Al Unser Sr. with a solid ride for this year's race. Very solid, Bob. You'll notice he's coming out right next to the wall and then dropping down again. Uh, like Gordy and some of the other cars have done to stay away from the air against the wall there and then coming right back up next to the wall and easily staying off the line just barely coming off plenty of room for him Al is a very very seasoned driver we all know that and he's just taking a comfortable ride here 
uh, I think the person to watch out for in this race is, as you say, the veterans, because uh, it is a peculiar type of race, and the cars are reacting a little bit differently this year. Uh, the tires, the cars, and a whole bunch of complicated situations that we've all been trying to work out. Fourth lap was 205.926, and the four-lap average, 207. 0.423 miles an hour, and that puts Allen's or Sr. inside of row number eight at the moment. But of course, the lineup is subject to change, especially tomorrow when we begin the bumping process. Now, his son, Allen's or Jr., qualified uh, also earlier today, and he had uh, a fairly good run, although off of what he had earlier this month, and in fact, a little bit slower than he had just yesterday, as he had a lap at almost 210 miles an hour in practice. But uh, here in the uh, earlier part of the day, Allen's or Jr. could only uh, have a 207.254 for his first lap, then a 207.905. Third lap dropped down to 205.954. And his fourth lap of qualifying was his slowest at 205.907. Can you account for the fact that uh, a lot of times the uh, speeds on laps three and four are slower? Do you just feel like that you've got the race made and you back off just a little bit, Dick? Well, I think, Bob, it's uh, two cases. If the car is perfectly comfortable, sometimes you see a man drop off on the last lap, and it's like Gordy said. He, he just wants to make sure he's in solid and, and he doesn't push it that little extra bit and cause it to break. On the other hand, most of the time, it's because one end of the car or the other is uh, heating up the tire. If it's loose, it heats up the right rear. If it's pushing, it heats up the right front. And that causes a little bit of push, as you saw in qualifying. Some of the cars lost continuously each lap. So his four-lap average was 206.752 miles an hour. Again, Kevin Kogan's car is undergoing technical inspection. As soon as it's finished, he'll wheel to the line and we'll have a qualification attempt at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Back at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and there's an indication of the wind and the wind direction here this afternoon. As you can see, there is very little wind. The instrument on the left there indicating how much wind there is, and of course on the right, the direction of the wind. It's from the southeast, but it's only about 10 miles an hour at the most, so really it isn't a factor in the practice and qualifications. There you can see it's about four miles an hour, sometimes dropping down to as little as three, averaging though right around four to five miles an hour uh, getting a little bit of gust there up to seven, but still not much of a breeze here uh, this afternoon. And that has been one problem that has plagued the drivers, especially in the early part of this week. Well, while Kevin's car is undergoing technical inspection, the track has been open for practice, and a couple of drivers have gone onto the speedway, including former winner Tom Sneva. There he is on the back stretch, getting the tires heated up and looking for a qualification speed. By the way, earlier today, when Allen's or Senior qualified for this race, we broke a record for previous, or rather, a number of previous winners in the starting lineup, eight. And we could get a ninth if Tom Sneva qualifies for his 500-mile race this afternoon or tomorrow. It's been a very long month for Tom Sneva. As you know, he has crashed twice in practice, and they have gotten the cars rebuilt now, and he's struggling to get back up to speed, but that has to be a very emotional and a very uh, draining thing on a driver to have crashed twice and not yet made the field. Yes, it does, Bob. In fact, I think sometimes the driver starts to wonder if he's losing some of his control over the car. But unfortunately, I think personally something broke on Tom's car the first time, and that was an acceptable thing by a driver. Uh, and, yep. and then it's, in other words, it's a situation where the driver is trying to do his best, and if something goes wrong, he's not sure whether he lost it sometimes or whether something might go on the car. And in Tom's case, it was a sad situation because two in a row makes him start wondering. But he's out here practicing, and he's doing a heck of a good job and coming back up on his feet. Both of his crashes were in the same area of the racetrack, and they were quite similar in nature. The car just simply wouldn't turn as he came off of this uh, first corner onto the short shoot down south into the racetrack. He came in contact with the wall. Now, Sneva has uh, been turning in laps here at 206 and a half miles an hour, so he is certainly up to a qualification speed. We have the stopwatch on him on this lap also, so it could be that Tom Sneva will soon be in the qualifying line to attempt to run, and as a matter of fact, he's coming off the racetrack, and this crew may have uh, clocked him that previous lap at 206.560 miles an hour, and they may be saying to Tom, let's push, her to push it to the qualification line. Well, as we mentioned, the wind 
was a factor, especially in the early part of this week. And we talked to a couple of drivers about the wind problem here at the Speedway. I think usually it's turn three when the windows uh, get high up, there's, there's like a small corridor there that uh, filters between the bleachers. So you can go in there uh, without filling the wind, and then once you're in there, you get a corridor of wind that can push you off the racetrack. The only thing that's a problem really is gusty winds at the Speedway, and that's probably more of a factor to slow down the times than anything. And my feeling is the worst place is turn three. Uh, you can go through there three or four times and have the car understeer and then the fourth or fifth time go through and all of a sudden have an oversteer because if you get a gust of 20, say 20 miles an hour, all of a sudden your front wings have just picked up 20 miles an hour and have that much more downforce. So it can be a really touchy situation. That's probably the most dangerous time here. So those are the comments about the win from Jose Le Garza and Kevin Cogan. Let's ask our driver expert in the booth here, Dick Simon, if he agrees with all of that. Yes, I do, Bob. Actually, uh, driving in a tough wind is like, uh, you know, you walk out on that limb and that one more step is the one that breaks the branch. And when you're trying to qualify and get your car up to top speeds for the Indianapolis 500, you're walking that edge, that fine edge. And when a wind kind of moves the car a foot, you're not sure whether the car actually just slid slightly or whether it was the wind that moved it. If you have a chance to run in the wind quite a bit, then of course you settle down. But it does make the drivers nervous and sometimes it does cause the cars to move slightly and break loose sometimes. So it is hard to run in a very stiff wind. But fortunately today we haven't got that kind of wind. Boy, it would have been fun last weekend if we had this kind of weather. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think uh, travel. weather conditions are just about ideal today. As we watch Danny Sullivan practicing in that 86 March, the one that he put in the field earlier today. It would seem that uh, conditions are just about ideal, and as the afternoon draws on within the next half hour, the shadows are going to completely cover the main straightaway into turn number one, and that's going to make things better. Yes, actually, the cooler it gets, the better it gets, and sometimes it'll pick up about uh, for the cars in uh, proper weather conditions and cooling down in the evening, anywhere from two to three miles an hour. That's why we call it happy hour, sometimes between five and six o'clock when <laughs> everybody comes out during the practice of the first week there and tries to set a fast time for the day. You can see the shadows now about halfway across the main straightaway. There's been a lot of discussion since the track opened about why the speeds aren't as fast as they were last year. Well, Larry Newber has an examination of that very problem. Since the beginning of motor racing time, the preeminent consideration has always been the coefficient of friction, adhesion, cornering speeds. And at Indianapolis in 1987, it is the major factor. In front of me is the footprint that an Indianapolis car makes around the oval. And a footprint that is solid around the oval is the difference between a 210 mile an hour lap and disaster at the speedway. I know it doesn't look like very much because it isn't, but it's a very tricky maneuver to make this a solid footprint on the racetrack all the way around. In 1987, Goodyear has brought a brand new product to Indianapolis. It's the radial tire. Well, what we have in the new Goodyear radio is a new product. And in any highly technical situation, like you got at Indianapolis, with very sensitive cars, very high speeds, uh, you introduce a new product and it takes some people a little longer to adjust to it than others. There have been at least 15 spins or crashes this month, mostly directly related or indirectly related to the tire situation. Now, it's a very temperamental subject for the teams to issue any type of complaints or criticism of Goodyear. There are financial as well as social considerations involved. But as near as we can ascertain, we do not have a tire problem here. It can best be described as a compatibility situation. Frankly, the new Lolas just seem to work better with the radials than the new Marches. When we first arrived, and we'd done a lot of testing here in March and in April, track conditions were fairly green, and we thought that when we came to the month of May, they'd be better. With hindsight, what's happened here is the hot weather has made the track very, very slick. And as the grips deteriorated, the, uh, the stiffness of the march has worked against us. But uh, we've been working now for about a week, and slowly but surely we, we, we feel that we're getting a handle on it, and uh, the speed's coming back. But if there's one difference between the two cars, the march is a much stiffer, tighter chassis than the Lola. The current situation is that it's a new thing. It's a new feel. It's the only contact between the guy, the driver, and the road. And so certain guys, certain chassis, uh, certain situations are entirely new, and uh, it's getting better every day. Well, at the moment, the uh, Lola seems much better suited to the tires than a March, I and mean, we can say that for certain because all the Lolas are going well relatively easily, whereas the strong teams running Marches are running the same speed but not as easily. 
uh, in the long run, by the end of the year, I think things will equalize back because there is a lot of effort going into adapting the march to the radials. And uh, this is now underway. And I think that you know, the gap will close fairly rapidly. But at the moment, the Lolas seem to have a slight edge. The garages of Bobby Rahal's two sports team and Mario Andretti's Newman Haas team are shuttered now. Their work is done. These two extremely well-financed Lola teams did most of the off-season testing on the new radial tires. And even the March teams that were involved in most of the testing are closest to being on top of this situation. And even as we speak, Robin Hurd, one of the chief designers of March Engineering, is back in England in the wind tunnel, hoping to bring back still more secrets to Indianapolis here in the final week of the month of May. We'll talk more about this problem with Dick Simon uh, in just a moment, but... Right, right now we're looking down toward the qualifying line and we see Kevin's Kogan's car now through technical inspection and Kevin is getting on the helmet and will be getting in the car in just a few moments to attempt a qualification run and another driver who has to be feeling good about his speed is Tom Sneva. The last lap we had for him was 207.61 miles an hour so Sneva may be attempting a qualification run here in just a few moments. There is a uh, Tom Benford is talking with Kevin Kogan, and there is Derek Daly, who qualified earlier today for a 500-mile race. And uh, we pick it up here on lap number three. His first two laps were 209.663 miles an hour. Second lap was 208.663, so just one mile an hour difference in the two. And on lap number three here, Derek Daly, who's now making his home in Noblesville, Indiana, is about to complete lap number three. Derek's making a very smooth run here, Bob, and coming out close to the wall and riding right on down, although he is cutting under the line there a little bit. That sometimes is because the driver's trying to make up for what the car is doing, and he needs to drop down just a little bit so he doesn't tag the wall coming off. I think there's a bump there going into turn number two. We see some of the cars uh, suffering through it more than others. Is it a serious problem? If you set your shock absorbers properly, Bob, no. Uh, you'll see some cars bounce over it, and you'll see some cars go over it as though it didn't exist. The rebound and the bump on the shocks make a big difference here at Indianapolis. And Leo Mel made the statement that, uh, you know, a lot of the teams are getting the compatible situation. If you look at who's driving the Lolas, you're looking at all the old people. And I really think that the older drivers have an advantage at this uh, race with all of the newness of everything because we can communicate better. Derek Daly's four-lap average was 207.522. That was the second Buick to qualify for this year's 500-mile race. The other was qualified last weekend by Rich Vogler. And Derek Daly is another one of those who has been struggling all month. He came here and ran some uh, laps quickly but dropped back, and we asked him how he fi found the extra miles an hour. It came from 700 miles of running over the last six days, and... The, the car-tire combination is a problem, but it's not one or the other, it's the compatibility. Um, we've just found eventually through learning a tiny bit each day what now makes the car reasonably comfortable, and that's where the speed comes from. You had to almost be afraid after the practice yesterday to even touch the car for fear you might lose some miles per hour. Yeah, we've had the similar gremlin that people have had uh, made a tiny change and completely lose. You don't lose one or two miles an hour, you can lose 10 miles an hour. So yesterday we had a setup. we took exactly the same thing out this morning, ran 209 this morning, and just put it away and said our prayers. And it worked for Derek Daly, and right now Derek is on the outside of row number seven. And on the racetrack is Kevin Kogan from Redondo Beach, California. Finished second in last year's 500-mile race, and he is about to uh, take the green flag for a qualification attempt. Once again, we have uh, had him right around 206 here late in the afternoon. Very high, Bob. If you watch Kevin, he has an unusual groove, and quite often the people on turn two there at the observation station will step back about a foot because he comes right up to within inches of the wall. Kogan completes the first warm-up lap, and as we showed you earlier in the show, he must take the green flag next time around. Here he is at the north end, the south end of the uh, racetrack. Off of corner number two, very high it looked like, but on the back stretch safely. Let's go down to Larry Newber. Well, Bob and Dick, uh, despite that aborted run that Kevin had this morning, we told you he was the first one out, he has had some consistency all day in, other than that. He had a 207 before he went out to qualify, and a 207 again this afternoon, and that was in the height of the heat of the day. That was about one o'clock, and Kevin Kogan looks like that he is ready to go 
he was telling all of us that, man, I'm hungry. I want to go. I want to get this out of the way. I want to qualify for the Indianapolis 500. The green flag is out, and Kevin Kogan is on his 10-mile, four-lap qualification run. Earlier today, he turned in laps of 204.867. 204.109 and 203.486 and the crew felt that he could do better so they displayed the yellow flag that counted of course as a qualification attempt and the car is allowed three attempts here he is on the back stretch right now headed for turn number three and Kogan hopes to put it in the field this time notice the groove he's running there Bob he comes right out to the edge and that edge has been pushed out by many cars who had a little too much push so he is uh, very well and yet coming out extremely high on the here he is, completing lap number one, Kevin Kogan. Standing by for the time and speed report. See if he is improving what he ran uh, in the early part of the day for a qualification run. And it's a good speed, 205.681 miles an hour. So he is faster than he uh, was earlier in the day by about one mile an hour. You can actually notice now the next time we'll tell the story as to whether the tires are overheating or whether he will drive a consistent amount. If the speed drops a little bit, it's probably overheating. If the speed picks up a little bit, he's in good shape. Kogan off turn number four onto the main straightaway once again. If he makes this year's field, it will be his seventh 500 mile race. And of course, his best finish was second here last year, but he's had a, mother, a couple of other top five finishes. He was fourth in his rookie year, and he was fifth in 1983. Second lap is 206.403, so it's about uh, almost a mile an hour faster than his first lap. 206.403 for Kevin Kogan. You notice there, Bob, he didn't come out as high that last time and the speed did pick up a little bit. I think the car is actually handling a little better now. He should, well, he's dropped down there a little, bit. a little bit. That might be a little bit. Now this car is powered by a Chevy Ilmore engine, the Pat Patrick team going with the Chevy this year. There he is crossing the line and taking the white flag and completing his third lap of qualifying. So it's less than a lap to go now for Kevin Kogan. And the third lap is uh, just a little bit slower than uh, lap number two, but better than the first lap. It's 205.714 miles an hour. There you can see his three lap average is 205.932. Coming off there very nice now. He's just holding it, I think, the same uh, by the looks of the drive on it, Bob. It should be very consistent on this one. He might have lost just a little speed. All right, the checkered flag is being displayed now by Dwayne Sweeney and Kevin Kogan has qualified for this year's 500 mile race. And he's done it in fine fashion as his uh, four lap average will undoubtedly be above 205 miles an hour. His fourth lap is better than uh, the third and it's 206 miles an hour, 206.200. And the four-lap qualifying average is 205.999. That's as close as you can come to 206 miles an hour. So Kevin Kogan will be coming into the pit area, and we'll have a chance to talk to him in just a moment. Our first qualifier here on ESPN Live from Indianapolis. The skyline of downtown Indianapolis, which is beyond the backstretch, and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway welcoming ESPN Speed World to their facility, and we must say that we're very glad to be here for three out of four days of qualifying. Tomorrow also, let's go down right now to Gary Lee, who's with Kevin Kogan, who just qualified. Well, Kevin, you said you were not going to eat till after you ran. You can eat now. Congratulations. This ends a very trying two-week period. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I was hoping for Marlboro Jensen and Mobile One that we could do a little bit better job. We, uh, you know, we thought we'd come here in the win wintertime. We came we're real fast, like almost 215, no problem. And uh, we've just been struggling all month. We just haven't had the car set up very good, I guess. And obviously, it's very easy to get frustrated and down on yourself and the crew, and you really have to pick yourself up and get on with the project. Well, you know, the crew has been the most amazing part. I don't know how many hours these guys have slept in the last five or six nights, but I bet you they add up to maybe 10 or 12. And uh, it's just incredible, the effort. You know what I mean? They just stand behind me and just keep, we just kept working at it, and we never really had a good setup. And today we're pretty good, but 
Uh, our car is very critical to fuel load, and, and uh, even when I qualified just now, it was quite a bit slower. I, qu I was much quicker just about an hour ago. So, you know, it's just it's very, very critical, these cars. Earlier, we had documented what happened late in the race last year. I know at that point, you were very eager to come back this May and do just a tad better. Well, you know, I mean, I wanted to come back and win the race. I think that uh, we're going to work very hard tomorrow to come up with a better setup that's good for the race. Actually, I think that the car is in that sort of a setup right now. We have a pretty steady, solid car. I just now am having to work with an exit understeer, an exit push. And I think that for the race is not such a bad thing to have to work on. Some people second-guessed your wave off this morning. Some folks second-guessed why you went out right now and, and did not wait until 5 or 5.30. Well, uh, the reason we did that was because we have a spare car, and if we go tomorrow, then we miss, we're miss. we behind everybody who goes today. So we wanted to uh, be able to use the spare car today if we had to. So, you know, we're I mean, the way things have been going for me, we wanted to have all of our bases covered so far. Now it's time to take some pictures, have something to eat. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, that is Kevin Kogan, and he has become our 11th fastest, our 11th qualifier of the day at 205.999 miles an hour. Now the track is open for practice at the moment. No qualification runs, but Ed Pim's car was in the technical inspection line. However, it's now being pushed back, and so at the moment there is no indication from anyone that he is ready to qualify. But several are taking advantage of the practice period, including Steve Chassis here entering turn number three. Steve has uh, not yet qualified for this year's 500. We count about 10 car driver combinations who have not yet made uh, this year's field, but are capable of doing so. Now, earlier in the day, uh, Jose Le Garza, former rookie of the year here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, qualified for his seventh 500 mile race. Jose Le Garza turned in speeds of 206.607. His second lap dropped down a bit to 205.550. His third lap was 204.685 miles an hour. But Jose Le Garza is solidly uh, in the field. There you can see the third lap, 204.685. At that point, his three lap uh, average. But he put it in the field. Uh, right now is in the middle of row number nine as the lineup stands right now. Joseli with a nice smooth run, Dick. Yes, it is. Actually, uh, Joseli's had a little bit of problems, but he's doing a nice run here, and it all came together for him. And I'm sure he's looking forward now to the race. And his fourth lap of qualifying was 205.936 miles an hour. And that made the four-lap average for Jose Legarza 205.692. Another driver who has uh, been struggling all month. He found speed early in the day, but uh, lost it and found it again. And there are the silver dollars that are being presented to Jose Le. Phil Headback, who has been a sponsor of a race car for many years here at the Speedway. Uh, Bryant Heating and Cooling uh, giving Jose Legarza a... Uh, Helmet full of silver dollars. <laughs> well, there is Ed Pym, and we told you that his car was in the technical inspection line, but now is not. It's being pushed to the north end of the racetrack. The yellow light has been displayed, so the cars that were on the racetrack are going to be coming in. Let's go to Larry with perhaps an indication of why Pym pulled out of the qualification line. Bob, when the month began, I counted 19 people as almost givens that would make this year's Indianapolis 500, and I still feel that Ed Pym is among them. But frankly, they are just not ready right now. There was no intent to qualify when they went up to the inspection line. But what they are doing are making all those fine-tuning adjustments to the wings. They are making sure the ride height is properly. They've tried to make some internal adjustments to loosen up that chassis a little bit, as we've heard earlier in this broadcast. And they just moved up to the inspection line and said, hey, fellas, come over here and look at this make sure it's legal because if the car is in legal configuration we're going to go out and practice and maybe we've stumbled upon something next time we come back we're probably coming back to go qualify it all right thank you for that report larry bob one of the things i can talk about that they might have been checking there for instance uh, first weekend uh, we got uh, 
tossed out of the line because we were one sixteenth of an inch too high on the <laughs> rear wing. But in all honesty, uh, that's an honest error because in the practice session, the shocks didn't uh, have enough settings on it, and we ground off just about a sixty-fourth of an inch of the wood that's on the front of the car. When you run your parallel line along the bottom, that made the wing illegal, and I'm sure that they were checking some things just to get that little sixty-fourth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch because at two hundred miles an hour, it makes one big difference. Put your hand out the window sometime when you're going 60 miles an hour and you'll notice that there's a point when your fingers, if they drop just enough, will all of a sudden take off downward real quick. And at 200 miles an hour, a 64th of an inch can make a big difference. It's amazing how small of a fraction of an inch can make in the, the way a car performs. Well, there is uh, Gordon Johncock, who is uh, going on to the track for some practice. Uh, Tom Sneva's car, by the way, is being pulled back to the garage area, and we anticipate perhaps they're putting some fuel in it to make a qualification attempt. We'll know more about that in just a moment. Right now, we'll check on a rookie who qualified for the 500-mile race, the American Racing Series champion for 1986, Fabrizio Barbaza for, uh, from Monza, Italy. One of those who participated in the United States Auto Club Rookie Orientation Program, which is always held in the latter part of April. Now, Fabrizio, uh, by virtue of the fact that he was the ARS champion last year, was supposed to have gotten the ride that Gordon Johncock is in, that's been entered by Patrick Racing, but instead, he got this ride, Arciero Racing, and he is... Uh, uh, Quali he has qualified very well for this year's 500-mile field. In fact, he is the second fastest qualifier today so far. Yes, actually, he's doing very well. As a rookie here, uh, I had the opportunity to watch uh, Brabezio and all of the rookies because we had Ludwig here, and also we gave a rookie test to Davy Jones in the United States Auto Club Rookie Orientation Program. It's fantastic for the fellows to have that because they can get here when they are not actually being bothered by other cars out on the racetrack. 208.0338 was the qualification uh, average for Fabrizio. We ask him about adapting to IndyCar racing. No, if the car is okay, if the car don't have problem, is no big difference here on road course or city track or something. The big problem is the is the speed. Worldwide, this is the Indy 500, the world's greatest race. Emotionally, do you get caught up with the fact that you are finally at Indy? What do you feel like out there qualifying with all these fans watching? I feel uh, okay. I think my, <laughs> I feel, I, I feel me exciting next week with when 400,000 people come here for the race. But now, I'm no exciting. So the uh, English is a, a little broken, but nevertheless, Fabrizio Barbaza is excited about having made his first 500-mile race. The track is open for practice, and speeds hopefully continue to climb as we watch more qualifiers today here at Indianapolis. Live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for third day time trial activity and the track right now open for practice since we have been on the air only one qualifier that was Kevin Kogan who clocked in at 205.999 miles an hour some of those going out for practice include Davy Jones also a Steve Chassis and a couple of drivers who have already qualified Gordon Johncock and Emerson Fittipaldi. Now a look at the drivers that still are looking for the speed that will put them in this year's race. Tony Bentenhausen uh, ran a lap at 201 earlier in a qualification attempt and came off of it, so he still has to qualify. Dominic Dobson had an engine explode right here on the main straightaway this afternoon, so he's working on that car. Rick Muskiewicz crashed uh, in the uh, practice session yesterday, but his car is fixed and he's ready to go again. Tom Sneva has been running laps in excess of 207 in the last few minutes. Rocky Moran also is among those who have not qualified yet. And the list continues. Davy Jones, who was practicing at about 200 miles an hour just a few minutes ago. Steve Chassie, Ed Pym, and Phil Kruger. So those are the drivers that are still to qualify. We have five spots open for the 500-mile race field, and that many to get into those five spots. 
rookies have been uh, quite a surprise here at the Speedway. A couple of them especially. Randy Lewis, who has virtually no super speedway or long track experience, did a fine job in qualifying today. Randy Lewis has concentrated on the road courses in his racing career, but he has adapted to the super speedways very well. Lewis went out for a qualification attempt earlier today, turned in a lap of 207.593, 205.738. His third lap was 205.992 miles an hour. You know, Fabrizio Barbatism mentioned an interesting uh, thing there, Dick, when we talked to him just a few minutes ago. He mentioned the emotion that a rookie has in coming to the Speedway here. And by the way, his uh, fourth lap here for Randy Lewis as he takes the checkered flag was 205.526, giving him a four-lap average of 206.209. And he's driving for A.J. Watson, who, of course, has been around the Speedway for many years, was the top uh, builder and chief mechanic back in the 50s. Fabrizio Barbaza mentioned the emotion of a rookie. Does that give you veterans an advantage on them? Uh, you're more relaxed. You're more comfortable. You know what's going to happen. Does that give you an advantage over a rookie, you think? Well, I think so, particularly at the start of the race. Uh, it's a, a new feeling for anyone here their first time. And to go down towards turn one at the start of the race is just absolutely phenomenal the, the air is picking up in speed the, everything is picking up and you all of a sudden look down at your uh, rpm as you go into turn three and you realize you're 300 more rpm than you've been all month <laughs> and that's because you've got the same horsepower pulling with everybody and the air pulls you on in and of course as a veteran driver here after one year's race you're a veteran and uh, you you understand more of this and you're a little bit more used to it and can handle a little better but uh, they learn quick the rookies that come here are pros all right, let's go down to the pit area and have a conversation with Sammy Swindell, who's in this year's field. And all the sprint car fans are cheering for this guy right here, a two-time king of the world of outlaws, Sammy Swindell. But how much joy is there? You went about as fast as that stock block Pontiac could go, but right now you're the slowest in the field. Well, we just gave it our best shot. Our uh, center line machinist Union Pontiac uh, worked as good as we, uh, you know, as good as it has all month. Uh, the car was as perfect as we could get it, and... Um, we just had to settle for that speed and, and hope uh, that'll get us in the race. By midweek, in fact, even Thursday, it looked like maybe 200 would make the show. Then the speeds climbed yesterday and this morning in practice, so that speed may be a bit shaky. Yeah, well, we're going to be pretty close. Uh, it's still going to take six guys to, to get us out of the race right now, but uh, we're just going to wait and see what happens. But, uh, you know, the track got a little better, but I think a lot of guys caught on to what was going on with the new tires and, and the new cars, and, uh, uh, you know, they've turned it around. But you have no backup car, so this is it. Well, right now, this is, this is the only one we've got, so uh, we've, we've got to hope we stay in there. So Sammy has done all he can do now except to wait. Bob? Sammy Swindell right now inside of row number 10. He is the slowest qualifier in the field at 201.840 and so therefore is on the bubble. But we still have five more positions in the field to fill. And there is Tom Sneva who uh, is waiting in his car for the track to reopen for practice. Uh, the observers are out on the main straightaway looking for something that has apparently come off of one of the cars. Now Stan Fox is driving for A.J. Foyt this year and Stan Fox also qualified for the 500 mile race field earlier today. Laps at 205.517. The second lap was 206.498. Then he dropped down to 203 0.878 miles an hour on his third lap of qualifying so we see almost a three miles an hour difference between the second and third laps and here on his fourth lap he drops down even further to 202.229 miles an hour so despite the fact that Stan Fox uh, dropped off about four miles an hour between his second and fourth laps he made the field in pretty good shape qualifying at a four lap average as he takes the checkered flag from Dwayne Sweeney the four lap average 204.518 Stan is a rookie in this year's uh, 500 mile race Stan Fox as we said driving for AJ Foyt and you would have to believe that AJ is a pretty good coach well we asked Stan Fox about that pretty good guy he's been treating me pretty good and uh, I thought maybe last week when we hit the wall I might get fired you know you never know until you get back in there but he realized it was just a we just goofed up a little bit and we put the car back together and hopefully we'll get her in the show uh, we, we're 
I wish we'd been a little quicker, but who doesn't say that? But we're down towards the bottom of this thing, so now I got to keep my fingers crossed and just hope it holds up. You told the story of how after you crashed last week, he was making some adjustments to the wing in practice, and you were thinking, wait a minute, don't take quite so much wing out of this race car. Well, you see, when you're running, you never really know if you're really loose or pushing. It's a fine line. So I mentioned that I thought I was pushing a little bit, and, and he went to take some front wing out, and I just yelled, don't take a whole bunch out, which meant just a little bit, and he yells back, hey, you drive that son of a gun, and I'll take care of the mechanic in on it, and by golly, the car really felt good that time out. Stan Fox driving an 86 March, and five of the 11 cars that have qualified today are 86 Marches. I guess that a rookie coming to the Speedway like Stan Fox and like Davy Jones Dick would uh, be pretty comfortable with A.J. Foyt as their team leader, so to speak. <laughs> well, I would imagine so. In fact, uh, A.J. was uh, almost like a god to me when I first got started racing. I just couldn't imagine I was on the same racetrack. <laughs> Davy Jones turned in a lap at 205.381 miles an hour earlier today as he took the green flag. But as you will see in corner number four, he runs into a problem. Here he is entering turn number four right now. And as he comes out, the car gets very close to that outside wall. Look at him wiggle. I thought he had hit the wall up there coming out of four, but he saved it. Did a nice job of saving it, as a matter of fact. But at that point, uh, the crew decided to bring him in and hopefully uh, get four good laps. Look at this, Dick. Yes, actually, he lost the rear end, jumped out on him there, and he did a magnificent job of picking that back up. That took some real talent. So Stan Fox Very is in, day. but Davy Jones, Very here's Larry Newberg. Coming out at number four, eh? It really was. Uh, I really want to put the yellow out as quick as possible. I've seen him in a lot of trouble. AJ, uh, what did you say to him? Did you give him some advice and say, hey, we're going to go out a little later this afternoon? Well, we'll make some more practice runs. He ran 208 this morning. Uh, so we'll just have to go from there. I think he's all right. Now for George. Uh, we got our fingers crossed. Okay. Thanks, AJ. Comments from AJ Point. Now, Dick, you tutored Davy Jones and uh, rookie orientation here at the Speedway uh, last month. Yes, actually, uh, uh, Davey and Ludwig Heimrath both uh, took their tests in our cars, and they were both, in my opinion, two of the finest rookies I've ever seen at the Speedway. Davey Jones was very, very smooth, as Ludwig was, and I'm quite surprised, to be honest with you, Bob, that uh, Davey's not running faster. It, it, uh, I expected him to do so. I am, too. He's been up and down this past week in practice. I believe he reached 209 during the week, but just doesn't seem to have that speed now. I have a feeling, though, that he's going to make it before this weekend is over. We'll be back with more live time trials from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Well, tomorrow at 3.30 Eastern Time here on ESPN, same-day coverage of the Formula One race from Spa, the Belgium Grand Prix. That's at 3.30, preceding our live coverage here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which begins at 5.30. Now, they've already qualified uh, over in uh, Spa, and quite an interesting lineup. It's Nigel Mansell and Nelson Piquet in row number one. Then Ayrton Senna and Gerhard Berger, so the uh, Williams Hondas are performing quite well at Spa. In the third row will be Michele Alboreto and Alain Prost. In row number four, Thierry Boutsen and Ricardo Patrese. Those are the fast eight qualifiers for tomorrow's Formula One race in Belgium, and we'll have same-day coverage for you at 3.30 tomorrow afternoon. As far as cars on the track here at Indianapolis, uh, practicing some names that are quite familiar to Formula One fans. Jeff Brabham, whose father, of course, was a Formula One driver. Mario Andretti, former world champion, has been practicing today here at the Speedway. And Emerson Fittipaldi, there is Mario Andretti, as a matter of fact. And Emerson Fittipaldi has also been uh, out for practice here at the Speedway today. Well, Mario is getting in quite a bit of uh, track time, Dick. He's been uh, out yesterday he was out on the track earlier today and uh, is out there once again is he checking race day setups you think yes he is actually uh, the, as uh, we were talking earlier the preparation for race day is a total different car you want the car to handle safely and with a full load you have to allow for the fact that it does create a total different car and then half a load is different and an empty load is different so we'll try to get the car set up so that it's at its optimum during all of those periods Unfortunately, the uh, crashes have continued in the past week during the practice here at the Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway. Dennis Firestone crashed earlier in the month and suffered some damage to his uh, feet and ankles. 
and yesterday in turn number four again the car backing into the wall this time and uh, that meant the end as far as the month of May is concerned for Dennis Firestone. And Actually, as he was going through that turn there, you could see the back end of the car come around, and that's what caused it. It just jumped out on him. So Dennis Firestone is in Methodist Hospital at this moment. He suffered a concussion, also had some cracked vertebrae in the neck, and is reporting to have some uh, weakness in the shoulders and the arms, but we hope that uh, Dennis Firestone will complete recovery. Here's a slow motion, Dick. Perhaps you can yes. describe what's happening. The back happening. of the car gets just a little bit loose, and if the driver doesn't catch it quick enough, then what happens here? You see, he's turning right with the front wheels, but then he realized it was too late and tried to turn with it so that he would back it in at least, and that is a part of the control the driver does have. At a certain point, he can help to decide which way the car's going to hit. Big flash of fire there as contact was made with the ball, but as you can see, it was uh, put itself out very quickly, so there was no fire involved in the crash, but certainly an unfortunate uh, month of May for Dennis Firestone, who came here with a couple of brand new Lolas, but will not be able to compete in this year's field. Well, Derek Daly is out on the track right now. He, of course, has qualified uh, for this year's 500. It was earlier today at 207.522. Back with more from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway right after these messages. Many people here at the Speedway today as there was last Sunday, but still a pretty good crowd on hand here. I would say there was probably uh, 50, 60,000 people on hand here. They're in the hot sunshine as the practice continues on the track. Of course, we mentioned the crashes that have occurred. This feature now on safety in a race car. Not only is the contemporary Indy car the safest in history, but individual safety for the drivers is also at its highest peak ever. Bill Simpson is shown here demonstrating his personal confidence in the products. He's definitely a man who stands behind his products. He's a driver who provides much of the safety personal gear for the drivers at the Speedway. Makes a guy pretty happy when a friend of his walks away from something like that because it was pretty catastrophic. I think he's a really lucky fella. But also, I think that all of our stuff did what it was supposed to do. What happened to Poncho Carter? In my opinion, had that happened two or three years ago, Poncho Carter would not be here with us today. So, but it's still not enough, you know. It's just like, it's, you just have to keep going, keep going. Old helmets, uh, we go back, let's go back to the early 70s, were primarily polyester resin and fiberglass and expanded bead styrene liner. And they weighed about five and a half to six pounds. Today, uh, um, the equivalent of that helmet weighs about one pound three quarter ounces and uh, the shell is made out of a carbon fiber Kevlar combination using um, epoxy resins rather than polyesters and our shields are made out of a polycarbonate you can't shoot a 22 bullet through. the hardware is space age but so is the software the clothing that the drivers wear not only more color, but also the largest safety margin in the history of the sport. Well, the effectiveness of a fire suit is its ability to insulate a person from heat more than flame. Um, we've come to a point in driving suit technology where uh, an outer layer of material isn't anything more than a decorative piece, if you will. It's the pieces that go behind that that make a, a fire suit work. If you go back into the late 60s, early 70s, if a guy was into a fire, and you, it's obvious you're looking at A.J. Foyt or Mario Andretti, some of those guys, where they were out of, out of a situation within a few seconds and they still have burn scars. Today, a, a race driver can be reasonably comfortable here in Indianapolis Motor Speedway that if he caught on fire, was trapped in the car, he'd be reasonably safe for 35, 40 seconds without even feeling any heat. So that's a pretty amazing thing. The, the burn that I did came about because I had a couple of Johnny come lately sort of competitors that were saying that my product did not function as I said it would function. So when I did what I did, after that was done, I sent a tape to my competitor and said, put your money where your mouth is and I'll light the match for you, pal. And we never received a reply, nor did he ever set us off on fire. 
Now our uh, driver expert here in the booth today, we don't like to mention negative things, but I can remember you taking a pretty good flip out of Riverside a few years ago, so you can attest to the safety that's built into uh, not only helmets and things like that, but the race car itself. That's true, Bob. In fact, my helmet had uh, about five or six dents in it. The inside was completely busted up, and fortunately, I probably owe my life to Bill Simpson because it was a Simpson helmet. So once again, the track is open for practice. Nobody at this point wishing to qualify, but we could have more qualifiers in the next 20 minutes. We're live from Indianapolis. Gary Lee and Alan Massengale, this is Bob Jenkins. We're live at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for live time trial activity. There's the master control tower here. Alan Massengale is in there in what is the uh, scoring area here. We're in the infield tower along pit row here on the start finish line. This sort of the nerve center here at the Speedway with me Les Kimball to explain what's going on over here in this corner of the building. What we do in this corner of the building is a, a timing of the laps where the people are qualifying. We have a, one computer that gives us all the lineups at any time during that time. We have our master timer that gives us time and speed. We also have a computer that time is fed into, and it gives us time and speed. It feeds it out to the network of monitors that we have all over. So it gives us everything in just a few minutes. About five seconds is what it takes usually, isn't it? About five seconds, yes, before it's out on the air. Speed and efficiency is the key in the infield tower as well. All right, thank you, Alan. Well, some of the cars out on the racetrack for practice right now. Rocky Moran, Derek Daly, Mario Andretti has been out. So is Gordon Johncock and Phil Kruger. Now, Phil Kruger is driving uh, a Firestone, Dennis Firestone car from the same stable. So perhaps Phil can get that team in the race after all. There you can see the activity at the north end of the speedway. And that's Mario Andretti's car right there. But nobody at this point is in the technical inspection area which would indicate that a qualification attempt is imminent. Dick, we talked earlier about uh, the uh, emotion that's built into this race and the fact that rookies come here and just try as best they can to make this field. With more on that, here's Larry Nuber. Certainly the classic race itself on the final Sunday of this month deserves a great deal of adulation. But why so much consternation, so much discussion, so much sweat and tears for just qualifying for this race? What's really at stake here? All the sponsors pay attention to this one race more than they even do to the championship. And uh, if you succeed here, if, you're, if you do well here, the rest of the year, it's just gravy. I mean, I would be sick if I didn't make this race. I know because I, there's been a couple of times when I haven't made it. And, uh, I mean, it takes you a, a year to get over it. It takes until next May to get over the fact that you didn't make the race here last year. For me, for a rookie, it's, uh, it's just a lifetime dream. Being here at the Speedway, uh, when I came on the grounds here a couple weeks ago at ROP program, uh, I mean, it's like I died and went to heaven. It's, uh, it's a special place. And uh, we're a long way from making the race right now. And, uh, you know, that's what we're working on. It's, it's not the money. I mean, if I, I can certainly think of a lot better ways to make a living than driving race cars because, uh, first off, I haven't made that, that good a living driving race cars for many years. Ever since I got hurt in 1974 at Syracuse, I've had to beg, beg every ride uh, that I could get for about the next five years after that to try and prove to everybody that I could still drive a race car even though I had a, a left arm that didn't work 100%. So I had a lean spell in there for about five, six years where uh, I didn't make very much money. Let's put this in another financial perspective. Now, two years ago, Pancho Carter lasted only a few laps, finishing absolutely last in the race. But his total winnings for that year, now it was an extreme circumstance, because he did sit on the pole, were $100,000 for that race alone. So there is a lot of money at stake. The purse amounts to over $4 million. Last year's winner, Bobby Rahal, won $581,062, over a half million. And the 33rd place finisher in last year's race was Tom Sneva, walked off with a cool $76,962. That was for last place. And the earnings go up from there. So not only is it a motion, but it's also a lot of money involved. Now, the 87 pole winner, Mario Andretti, 
$70,000 in cash and a $30,000 van just for winning the pole position and not even turning a wheel on race day. That's what's at stake at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Danny Sullivan confers with members of his pit crew. He's already in this year's field. We'll be back with more from Indianapolis right after this. Motor Speedway where 28 cars are now in this year's field. We have had 11 qualifiers today. Let's review the field as it stands. In the front row, Mario Andretti, Bobby Ray Hall, and Rick Mears. Row two, A.J. Foyt, Roberto Guerrero, and Dick Simon. In the third row, Ari Leyendijk, Johnny Rutherford, and Michael Andretti. In row number four, it's Emerson Fittipaldi, Ludwig Heimrath Jr., and Rich Vogler. In the fifth row, Jeff McPherson, Scott Brayton, and Jeff Brabham. Number six, Gary Bentenhausen, Poncho Carter, and Danny Sullivan. In the seventh row, it'll be Fabrizio Barbaza, Gordon Johncock, and Derek Daly. In row number eight, Al Unzer, Al Unzer Jr., and Randy Lewis. And in the ninth row, it'll be Kevin Kogan, Jose Legarza, and Stan Fox. And all alone in row number 10 at the moment with the slowest qualifying average in the field at this point, Sammy Swindell at 201.840. The track remains open for practice. No qualification attempts ready at the moment. We have five positions remaining op open in the field, and we will be right back with more. And has been bringing you historical Indianapolis films. We call the series Legends of the Brickyard, and they're on all this month right here on ESPN. Races uh, 1975 through 1986, and we have a mini version of Les uh, Legends of the Brickyard coming up for you right now. Legend of the Brickyard. The speedway has been shut down twice in its history. He was almost an indirect victim of Hitler's Nazi regime falling into an extensive state of disrepair during the Second War when Wilbur Shaw, then retired from racing, convinced Tony Holman to any up the money to reopen Indianapolis. Their biggest jobs were weeding and painting. Automotive technology at a virtual standstill during the war, so many of the cars racing here in 46 were ancient by today's standards, some about a decade old. One of the newer cars, driven by a youthful George Robeson, won. He became part of the Hex legend on former winners of the 1940s and 50s, dying in a race car later that summer on a dirt track in Atlanta, Georgia. There's Tom Sneva, who's awaiting to qualify. Where were you in 1946, Dick? Were you uh, here at the Speedway? Or were you thinking about driving at the Speedway someday? No, not actually. Uh, I think I was 32 years of age when I started thinking about driving. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> That's a true story. I really? parachuted into a local fairgrounds in Salt Lake City uh, as a parachutist, and they asked if we wanted to take a ride during the intermission. That was the start of my racing career. I fell in love with it that night. You uh, have a history of doing things that most people would consider dangerous. I wouldn't dream of jumping out of an airplane in a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have over uh, about 1,500 and some odd all jumps and wow. uh, won the nationals in, in sport parachute. You still do it just to keep in shape or are you confined nope. to racing? <laughs> nope. Well, Tom Sneva is waiting. Let's get an update on the situation down there from Larry Newber. Well, Bob, it's almost a surprise decision. Uh, a few moments ago, I talked to John Anderson, Tom Sneva's crew chief. They were at 207. I said, you're going to go out? Geez, we don't know. What made the decision? Well, you know, it's just time to go. The conditions are, uh, you know, not perfect, but they probably aren't going to get any better. And, uh, you know, we just hope we can run uh, fast enough to put her in the show. Are we in a decision or a situation here where, well, we know we can go faster, but that 206 will get us in, so let's take it now while the money's hot? Yeah, we'll be happy if we can put four together at 206. That'll be fine. Uh, you know, we just need a little more time with the car. The car is very sensitive, and, uh, you know, we worked with it a little bit today, and so the Skull Bandit's better than it was this morning, and uh, we'll see what happens qualifying. The car is a patchwork quilt, Tom. I see winglets from Johnny Parsons' car, a rear wing that is not painted, and the pyramid on top tells me it's an 86 car. You guys have done a lot of thrashing. Well, we have. The guys have worked real hard, and, uh, you know, some of that's my fault when you try to knock down the walls uh, <laughs> with two different race cars. Uh, the guys have worked their tails off, and, uh, you know, so it'd be nice to get in the show for them, and uh, maybe they can have a day off, but uh, there's not much time to relax. TT on the nose, uh, the team car, or Tom Terrific? What's that stand for? Tom Terrific? Ah, I don't know what it stands for. I don't think it's Tom Terrific. I don't think that's what the guys have been calling me all week. It's probably something else, but... Uh, you know, we got a good bunch of guys that work real hard, and, uh, you know, I'm happy I'm with the Skull Bandit team. Tom, we thank you for joining us, Bob. They're very busy right now. Remember that Tom Sneva is the man that 
because of some of his past performances here in Indianapolis that you'd have a hard time disputing someone who said he has been the best of the contemporary drivers among qualifiers here in Indianapolis. Indeed, he has a terrific qualifying record. This will be his 14th race if he makes it. So now, as we wait for Tom Sneva to get into the qualifying line, the track yellow for a track inspection. So we'll take this break and be right back with more. Indianapolis Motor Speedway live here on ESPN. We're just about out of time as far as our broadcast uh, for today is concerned. Tom Sneva's car is still waiting to go through the technical inspection, so it's going to be uh, a few minutes before he can get on the track. Well, let's go down to our pit reporters and get an assessment on what has happened today and what might be expected tomorrow. Here's Larry first. Bob, today unfolded just about like I expected. I sat down last night before we prepared finally for this broadcast, and I counted 32 cars, 32 combinations, which should make the field. Yes, that leaves but one for about six or seven drivers to scramble around for. Certainly Ed Pym and Tom Sneva, whom we just talked to, are among those I expect to be in the field. Speed, Poncho Carter's 203 plus is looking pretty good. How about you, Gary Lee? By what you're saying, Larry, and that uh, we talked earlier with Sammy Swindell, and this place has been very fickle. Some days the cars are up in speed, some days they're down. We've seen them up today earlier before it got hot on the racetrack. Tomorrow, well, just maybe not only will Poncho be safe, but if the speeds go back down, maybe Sammy Swindell will be safe. We still have six spots to fill. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Well, uh, Dick, let's get your assessment. What do we look for tomorrow? Now, of course, we're not going to be looking for any of uh, the so-called top drivers to qualify, but the last day of qualifying is always exciting because you do have uh, drivers bumping other slower drivers out of the field. Yes, you do. Actually, tomorrow is a, uh, a real important day to everyone because those who aren't in the race, uh, this is the whole thing. That The whole year is here almost, and... and the money that's involved in this race, the sponsorships, the trade relations, the exposure, it's all there, and it's all on the line tomorrow. And the cars that are left and the drivers that are left have to be going through tremendous pressure. I know I've been there myself, and it's, uh, you know, when God's on your side and everything goes together like it did for us this first weekend, I just have to say thanks for the whole month because it's been great, and we're looking forward to a fantastic race, and I'd hate to be one of these tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to your comments uh, tomorrow here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And our time trial activity from uh, Indianapolis has been brought to you by Mobile One Synthetic Motor Oil. Mobile One protects your engine better than any conventional motor oil. And by Kingsford Charcoal. Kingsford burns hot when some others might not. When you're hot, you're hot. The grid as it stands. Andretti, Ray Hall, Mears in the front row. Foyt Guerrero and Simon in row two. In the third row, Leyendijk, Rutherford, Andretti. Fourth row, Fittipaldi, Heimrath, and Vogler. In the fifth row, McPherson, Brayton, and Brabham. Bettenhausen, Carter, and Sullivan in row six. Seventh row, Barbaza, John Cock, and Daly. Unzer, Unzer, and Lewis in row eight. In the ninth row, Kogan, Garza, and Fox. And in the tenth row, Sammy Swindell, the slowest qualifier at the moment. Coming up next is the Scholastic Sports America with Chris Fowler. And, of course, Sports Center is coming up a little bit later with Chris Berman and John Saunders. They'll be bringing you up to date on the Preakness and the NBA playoffs. And Alan Massengale will have a wrap-up of what happened here in the final half hour. For now, thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. This is Bob Jenkins. So long, everyone.